You know, when I was uh, growing up, I don't know about you, but when I was a child and I was actually reading Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, I wasn't quite clear what was going on. Um, you see, you read the chapter 1 in Genesis and you go through this whole creation account and it go day by day. And then it ended with humanity, male and female, formed in the image of God. And then God looked at it, it was good. And then it says, thus, you know, it was the heaven, creation of the heavens and the earth. And then you go to chapter 2, and all of a sudden the story, like, repeats itself again. But it's in a little bit of a different order. And as a child, I can remember reading that and thinking, this is weird. I mean, what is going on here? I mean, is this the same creation story or two creation stories being told? Anybody else ever have that question pop in your mind? I mean, be honest. It's okay. You're safe here, just so you know. You can question the text here. It's okay. Um, I always wondered about that. And so sometimes I'd ask my Sunday school teacher, you know, what's going on here? Why do the stories seem to be different? And this Sunday school teacher would look at me and say, I don't know. Which is a good answer, right? I mean, if you don't know, you should just be honest and say, I don't know. At least they were honest with uh, I asked my parents and friends, you know, I mean, wrestling with those texts, wondering about that story. And then I became a religion major at Florida Southern College and uh, studied under some great minds and read some great books and found out that there are actually two identifiable creation accounts in the Genesis story. As a matter of fact, the book of Genesis itself is a combination of four primary sources in the midst of Hebrew literature that have expanded and run a, a wide gamut of time, actually. And so we have the first creation account, and then we have in chapter 2 the second creation story. Now, some of you might be wondering, oh my gosh, my world is shaking. You know, are they two different stories, and is the story wrong? Uh, well, that's because you're reading it very narrowly. You need to open your mind and your eyesight a little bit. And rather than taking it so concretely and literally, open yourself to the movement of the Holy Spirit to see the width and the height and the depth and the beauty of the creation narrative. Amen? Because so much more is going on there. Don't just limit yourself to the words on the page, but experience the movement of the Holy Spirit that testifies to who God is and how God created things and how we fit into that creation. Amen? Amen. And so I always wrestled with that. And I got to college and they said, you know, there are those two separate. In seminary, I learned about it even more. And it kind of broadened my perspective of who God is and how God relates with God's creation, how God relates with humanity each person expressing their experience of this God who formed and breathed life into all things. And in both creation accounts, the story begins somewhere. It begins in a garden. Right? There's one right out there. Last chance, right? It begins in a garden. It begins in the garden, amen? amen? Both stories begin in the garden. God creates, and out of the garden, out of the dirt, plants and animals arise. We find ourselves in the beauty of God's creation in the midst of it all. It begins in a garden. We have a garden out here, don't we? Community garden, is it beautiful? I mean, what kind of experiences do you have in a garden? I know when I walk in the midst of a garden, things are born, things are created. I always feel at peace when I'm in a garden. I mean, there's something spectacular and wonderful about seeing plants grow. Now, I have a confession to make. Jan and Dave Etzel have asked me to be a part of the garden. And my response is, I like to eat from the garden. But you do not want me in the garden. Because I am a black thumb, not a green thumb. I mean, I kill plants. I just don't have patience for plants. But praise God, there are people who are good at gardening. Amen? Amen. Otherwise, I would starve to death. <laughs> But I love the garden, and I love being in the midst of the garden, and that's where the story begins. We find ourselves, God's creation, humanity, in the midst of the garden. God creates. Out of the soil, things arise. And we participate. There's an intimacy between God's creation, God's human being, humanity, God's creatures, and the plants that arise from the dirt. Which is why, in the Genesis account, it actually begins by... This image of arising and forming us out of the dust. Uh, God creates human beings out of dust. Now, a lot of times we think of dust and we think of our car. 
after we've driven around a long time without any car wash, right? And you find that kid that wrote, wash me on the back of your window. And we think of that as being dust. Or we might think of just scooping up a good handful of dirt, that that's the dust of creation. And while that's a part of it, really what I think is beautiful about this image of being created from dust is that it's much more universal. You know, scientists believe that each and every one of us, within our very bloodstream, you can find iron. That's metal, by the way. And all the metallic substances that we find on the Earth actually are born from stars. So you and I, and all living creatures in the world, have stardust coursing through our veins. That's how connected we are to the universe. It's not just in this place, it's the entire universe that we're associated with. It runs and courses through our very bloodstream. The dust of creation has formed us, and God has breathed into us the breath of life, amen? amen? And so when God creates us, forms us in God's image, and breathes us into us the breath of life, God calls us good, amen? We find that in the first creation account. Genesis chapter 1, you move through day 1, day 2, day 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and at the end of each proclamation, God looks at God's creation and says, it is good. Does God say, it's kind of eee? No? Yes. It's good, right? It's a good creation. Does God throw some things out? Not at that point, does he? God looks at God's creation and God says it is good. I have to confess, while all of us are formed in the image of God in some way or another, not all my creations have been good. I know that because occasionally when I have cooked, I set the meal down before Leslie or Emily or various people at the time, and I said, how is it? And sometimes people say, not so good. <laughs> so I am very thankful that our God is the God who creates and gives birth. Quick, give me a flicker. I'm just kidding. I'm on a roll now. <laughs> but we've been formed from the very depths of God's breath. We are part of God's creation. We've been invited to participate and be a part of God's creation in this world. And I don't think there's any gift greater than that. And so when God creates and he looks on his creation and says it is good, we also become aware that we are formed in the image of God, and thus we become image bearers. Each and every one of us, an image bearer of God, an image bearer of Christ, an image bearer of the work of the Holy Spirit through our lives. And yet sometimes I think we throw that language around a lot at the church, and we talk about what does it mean to you're an image bearer, yeah, cool, that's him, you know, go out and be an image bearer of Jesus, Ooh, I can do that, and then we get out there and we go, what does that mean? I think N.T. Wright, who's a very well-known New Testament scholar, um, he, he lays it out best. <laughs> it's driving Aaron crazy. He has, he has to see pictures. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go through it real quick, all right? Here's the creation picture. This is dust on the windshield, right? This is the handful of dust. Y'all follow me? All right. This is stardust, huh? <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't put any blood on there. God's creation is good, and each and every one of us are image bearers. N.T. Wright says that the best way to explain being an image bearer is to look in a mirror. So Leslie and I were in Scotland this past summer, and Scotland has a lot of windy roads and blind driveways. And one of the things you'll see on a tree or on a post is a round mirror just like this. So that when somebody's coming down the driveway or up the drive, you can see around the corner. And N.T. Wright says this is the best example of what it means to be an image bearer. In other words, we are mirrors positioned in order for us to experience God revealed through us and at the same time for God to experience God's creation through us. It's two ways. It's not just a one directional mirror. It's set at the corner. We find ourselves at the corner between God and God's kingdom and God's kingdom breaking through and God's creation that's unfolding all around us. We become a conduit through the Holy Spirit for God and humanity to build and to grow in relationship with each other. Isn't that cool? I love that image. You are a reflection of God's glory, of the light of Christ. 
That's what we hear in Scripture when Jesus says, be an ambassador to Christ, or be a minister of reconciliation, or offer yourself to the cause of peace, or lift up the poor and the oppressed. In other words, be that place where the light of God can shine into the world so that you can see around the corner and know what's coming. And guess what? God experiences it the other way. That's why we're a prayer-filled people, aren't we? I mean, we don't just reveal God. We also share with God. Guess what? Good things are going on here in the midst of your creation. There's a garden growing in Cornerstone, and we're all eating healthy finally. <laughs> and there are people who are advocating for justice in the midst of the world, and we're all a part of that. Thank you, God. And guess what? We're able to provide and resource the church for ministry. Thank you, Lord, for that. We share in our prayers for healing, and we advocate on behalf of each other, and we lift each other up, and we tell God how many good things are going on. Amen? Amen. And so it's this two-way reflection of God's glory. God revealed through our lives as we offer ourselves to the world in love. Where are those boys? They need to be in here. <laughs> <laughs> and conversely, us taking all the good things that are happening in creation, and we're revealing it back to God. Offering it back to God again. To be an image bearer means you're like a mirror. You're like an echo of the one who is divine. The one who's created it all. You are a creature. God is creator. And you've been invited to be a part of God's creation. So we have to shine forth in the midst of the world. Be a part of it all. Here's one part of that story, though, in Genesis chapter 2. It talks about two trees. One is the tree of life. Eat as much as you want from the tree of life. And there's another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Brian McLaren's book, I think it's interesting, he points out that that's the tree of judgment, which I kind of think is true, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and that kind of relates to this idea of being an image bearer of God in the midst of the world. They were called to be a reflection of the very character of God. In other words, to participate in that which is life is to embrace the life of God and to share that with as many people as we can. To allow that light to shine through our lives. To reflect the character of God. But when we participate and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what we do is we block the reflection of God and we take God's reflection on ourselves. In other words, we start playing God in the world. We start participating in the judgment of others. We start erecting the walls that separate and divide us from each other. We don't participate in the things that lead to life. Which reminds me of what Jesus said in the, in the gospel lesson today, Mark chapter 3. When the Pharisees are holding him accountable and they're saying, you know, should this, let's see if this guy heals on the Sabbath and breaks the law. You know, and Jesus says, what would you rather me do? Participate in the things that lead to life or the things that lead to death? And they're unable to answer that question because, of course, we should be participating in the things that lead to life. Amen? That's what it means to reflect the glory of God. But when we block that reflection and we only focus on ourselves and we become our own God and we start judging others in the midst of the world, that's when death and destruction occur. You want to know why there's so many wars going on in the world? It's because we're all playing God. Sure, we might use God's name, in whatever religious background we come from. But the truth is, we created our own idolatries against each other. And that's not being a reflection of who God is in the midst of the world. And God has created us that we might bear the image of God, to reflect God's glory, not to attempt to take on God's character for ourselves. We can't do that. Which gets me thinking. We can talk about it, we can preach about it, we can all nod our heads, you are right on, Pastor. Keep preaching. But unless we're living, embodying it before the world, it's really just kind of meaningless, isn't it? Yeah, two of you agree. Oh no, he's going to make us work. I don't know if I like this church. I think I'm going to go down to the church where I can just sit in the back. Well, the lights come down and then leave and be, feel good about myself and then next week I'll be depressed again because I'm not finding a way to connect with the world around me. I've got news for you. This is the gospel. It doesn't just exist in here. It's carried with us out into the world. 
And so if you want to be an image bearer, there's some great ways to get involved in that. And sometimes we get overwhelmed because we see all the problems in the midst of the world. We think there's no way we could possibly stop poverty. There's no way we can turn back all the environmental problems that are going in the world. There's no way. It's just too big and it's overwhelming. And if I think about it too much, my head might pop. Mine does. Don't worry, there's not an image of a head popping. You are safe. But there are some images I want to plant in your mind. We can connect in ways that help each other right here in our own community. It might be as simple as meeting your neighbor. That might be a good place to start. Hey, I'm Roy. Your name? Sue. Nice to meet you, Sue. I live next door. Good place to start. Might be right there. Or you might go down to Grace Place for children and families, just right around the corner here. And uh, you might uh, help uh, fill a bag full of groceries to hand out to a family in need on Friday. Matter of fact, I was playing golf and uh, talking to one of my father's friends, and he says, I'm at Grace Place every Friday filling grocery bags. And I was like, that's awesome. I didn't even know he was involved in the community in that way. That's a simple way. Some of you bring groceries and drop them off at the, here at the church. That's a great way to be connected with people. For others, you might want to get involved in a child's life or in a family's life and become a mentor for them. Leslie and I were at a first watch having our Saturday morning breakfast, and there was a gentleman with a young man, and they were sitting at a table, and they were having this conversation, and I was eavesdropping. <laughs> because it was, such, it was an interesting conversation. Do you remember, did you eavesdrop too? Through me, right? <laughs> but the guy was talking to this young man. He was talking about how excited he was for him and how he was encouraging him, how he uh, was glad he was getting doing well in school and he's looking forward to his future. And he kept going on and on and on. It was just this, it was so affirming. I couldn't help but eavesdrop because I wanted to be affirmed too. I wanted to walk up and say, tell him, please affirm me a little. <laughs> And they got up from the table, and they hugged each other, and the man said, hey, you know what? I'm with you. I'm with you through thick and thin. And the part I almost missed, but, you know, that's fine in a moment. You know, where some guy signed up to be a mentor, and this is their first week together. And then he turned to Gil, he said, and the kid said, and you know, we've been together a long time. He says, and the, and the man responded by saying, yeah, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Oh, my God. That's being an image bearer. That's bearing the light of Christ to somebody, a commitment to somebody in our local community. To make it. Some of you, I know, will respond to Scott's call. And you'll pick up a hammer, and you'll go to Habitat this Saturday. And there's some opportunities that that might birth some other opportunities that I think will be huge. And we'll be a part of something, making a difference in somebody's life. I will tell you, I, uh, I love going to Habitat, but I do not like laying a song. Oh. Okay, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> but I still like being involved in it. It's not what our likes and, and interests always are. Sometimes it's just getting ourselves there. And the last thing I want to challenge you is because it's not just being a light bearer to other people, an image bearer of God's people, but also being an image bearer to what God is doing in the midst of creation and how God has called each and every one of us to be a caretaker of God's creation. What I love in the Genesis account in chapter 2 is they spend a whole, gosh, five, to five or four, four or five verses talking about the Garden of Eden. And what they talk about in the Garden of Eden is all the rivers, the Pishon, Tigris, Euphrates. And you get this image of this place that is very alive. Uh, not only are there plants and there's animals, but everybody's thriving in that place. And it's being fed by water and by streams. Do you all know the name of the watershed that we are all a part of here in this place? Anybody? What watershed is our home? Everglades West Coast. Everglades West Coast Watershed. Thank you, Danny. He was here in the early service. <laughs> EWC. Everybody say that just like it's a good rap song. The EWC. All right? We live in the Everglades West Coast watershed. Uh, and this is it right here. 
See it? Yeah. Which one is it? That's our Eden. <laughs> That's our Eden. God has placed us here with purpose to make a difference in our community. And so we can connect with people and make a difference in people's lives, but we can also connect with God's creation, God's earth, and find ourselves deeply rooted in its soil and celebrating the rivers that run through it. You see, if we have a healthy watershed, we have a healthy community. Not just for us, but for all the creatures who live here, and for all the plants, and for the gardens. We will find an abundance because God created abundantly. Amen? If each and every one of us focused on one area, just our watershed, just think how, if that, that would transform the world, if rather than defining where we live by the county borders, which are defined by our government, and how much of us like government, Okay, good. You know, I love there's a line from a band that they say that, that borders are the scars on the earth. But the watershed is defined by God's creative ability and how the natural flow exists. That we might live abundantly in the midst of God's land. And what's really cool about our watershed is that it really is almost Collier County. Because there's some other folks that stretches over several counties and even over this whole center of, the, the, of our country. But that's our watershed. The EWC, the East Coast, East, the Everglades West Coast <laughs> watershed. It's our home. It's our Eden. And we've call, been called to be an image bearer and to let the light of God, the reflection of Christ, shine forth in this place. And in turn, we need to celebrate with God the ways that we're making a difference. That our rivers, our land, and our people might find health and liberation and equity and freedom and joy and healing. And it goes on and on and on. To the glory of God, in the name of the Father and the Son.